good morning, Sunday School. This is another day that the Lord has blessed us with. As I always say, I shall rejoice and be glad in the Lord, for I know it was only by his grace and his mercy that he allowed me just to see one more Sunday. So I thank you for joining us today. I hope you've had a blessed week. And our Sunday School lesson today is going to come out of Galatians chapter 3. So if you want to grab your Bibles, any pens or paper you might need, after prayer, we'll get started with our lesson. <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. Father, giving you the glory and the honor that you so deserve, Lord. We pray, O oh Father, that when we study this lesson today, that you would continue to crown our heads with the wisdom and knowledge you know we stand in need of. And Father, let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. Father, bless all those that are listening in to Sunday School this morning, that they may get a blessing out of the teaching. Most of all, Father, we just thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, okay. Got some water nearby. My throat keeps getting dry. So our, today our lesson is titled Freedom and the Law. Freedom and the Law. And like I said, it's coming out of Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 18 through 29. And I will be reading to you from the NIV version. <clears throat> and thus, verse 18 says... For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. In the law, therefore, uh, is the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. <clears throat> that ends the reading. We're going to talk, like I said today, about freedom and the law. Now, just think about laws. Who would want to live in a society that did not have laws? This society we live in has to have laws to kind of govern people where some don't get taken advantage of. Just think, if you didn't have any laws, people would do what they please. You had something they want, they come take it. They kill people, there were no consequences. So that's laws serve a purpose. And if we'll look back in Old Testament, it served a purpose. But after the coming of Jesus Christ, the law was no longer needed because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that allows us to be obedient to what the law meant in the beginning. So let's look and see what Paul is saying to the uh, city of Galatia. Now understand, Paul had already set this church up in Galatia. He'd set it up. He'd gone on his way. Well, then he gets word that they called them the Judaizer, which were people of the Jewish faith, were coming into this, this created Christian church family, telling them that they were not the children of God because they were not following the law. They had not been circumcised. They were not doing what the law uh, required them to do. So Paul is kind of writing them this letter 
to try to straighten out all of this misconception that has been dumped on them, and now they're in a, a world of confusion. So he's just trying to to give, put them back on, as we call it, solid foundation. And in our printed text, it starts with the word, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Now what he's telling them, if the inheritance, which we are all heirs to an inheritance, he said if it depended on the law, there would be no need for the promise. You'll ask, what is the promise? And if we go to Genesis 12, we'll see the promise that God made to Abraham. First one he called. It reads, uh, again, NIV version. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. It reads, the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. This is the promise made to Abraham. So when they said that inheritance does not depend on the law, there was no law in existence when God gave this promise to Abraham. So what we have today depended on that promise that God gave Abraham. It says, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. It was the grace of God that gave Abraham this promise. It was not the laws, but the grace of God. Now, if we look at the next verse, uh, 19, it says, why? Paul asked this question to the Galatians. Paul sort of asks and answers the question because it's a letter. He's writing a letter, so there's nobody to respond back to him, but he knows what the response will probably be. So he asks a question, then he comes back and answers it. He says in verse 19, Why then was the law given at all? Then he says, It was added because of transgressions unto the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. He tells them, Why then? was the law given. He said, if the law could do all God wanted to do, why, why was it given at all? And he tells them that it was added because of the transgressions that men were doing until the seed who the promise came through was revealed. Until Jesus Christ came, they were living under the law. Now understand, laws, the laws that were handed down through Moses, to the children of Israel. God had chosen these people as an example of how he wanted people that believed and trusted in him to live. So he had carved out this group of people, the Israelites, and he gave them laws. He gave them guidelines because he knew they were unable to, to be sinless. So he gave them guidelines to try and keep them as close to him as he could until Jesus Christ came. So when he gave them the laws, it was sort of just a guideline, just to keep them focused on being the example that he wanted them to be. And we know there were a lot of laws handed down by Moses. And it talks about the, the angels given through, I mean, the laws were given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Moses was that mediator God had given Moses the law, remember the Ten Commandments that God carved in the, in the stone and had Moses to go down to the people. Again, a, a guideline trying to keep the people locked into being focused on being obedient to God. And he tells them the mediator, however, implies that it was more than one party. Now, we understand a mediator usually as a person who's attempting to make people that are involved in a conflict come to an agreement between the two. That, that these two were not in conflict. God was not in conflict with man. Man was in conflict with God. So it's not a, a mediator of two people. It was for one because God was the one and the man had to be conformed to what God expected him to be. Then when you get to verse 20, it says, the a uh, high of a mediator implies more than one party, but God is one, and that's what I just said. Uh, the 
21 says, In the law, therefore, is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? And Paul answered that with an absolutely not. The, the law is not opposed to the promise. The law is conforming mankind to accept the promise. It says, For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. If following the law could give us eternal life, there would be no need for Jesus. But law couldn't do that because the way the law was constructed, if you messed up on one law, you may as well messed up on all laws because one law, one law break meant you broke all of the laws. So there was no way the law could give us salvation because we couldn't stay obedient to the law. Even in our state of today, having Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit resting in us, we still mess up. We still mess up. But praise God, Jesus is now that mediator between us and God to try and, and mediate between our sinfulness to God. He's the one that keeps us sinless before our Lord and Savior. The law was never intended to give eternal life. It always was uh, resting on Jesus Christ. Now, if we look at verse 22, no, the rest of 21, I'm sorry, it says, For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Then verse 22 says, But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Again, he's referring back to our belief in Jesus Christ is the only way for us to get salvation. How many of us know good people? You know, we know good people. We know people that don't uh, kill, steal, lie. No, we know good people, but if they do not have faith in Jesus Christ for their salvation, they will be lost when eternity comes. And that's what he's trying to get them. That's what Paul is trying to get them to understand. These Judaizers has come in with all these things you have to do in order to be a child of God. And Paul is saying, no, that's not necessary because Jesus has come and therefore the law is no longer needed. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, it reads, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to abolish, the, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This was Jesus Christ speaking. He's saying, I'm not trying to do away with the law. I'm coming to fulfill the law because you as man can cannot stay obedient to the law. Okay, now we're going to go to oh, verse 23. It says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. This it would imply that the law served as a restraint. Like I said, it's to keep us from straying too far from God, to kind of lock them in to what God's expectation was, showing them sin. Man really didn't know what sin was until he committed it. And then God had to give him examples and rules to let him know what sin was to him, what he should not be uh a craving what he should not be doing so it just gave us a restraint showing us what sin was that's exactly what scripture did and paul at this point draws that demarcation between the era of the law and the era of faith with jesus christ faithfulness in his work was was the transition period from the law to being justified by faith verse 24 so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. The law was our guardian. And we know when we talk about guard, if somebody has a guardian, they have someone that's 
overseeing them, someone that's making sure they're doing the right things, things somebody's looking out for their best interest. That's usually what a guardian did. And especially back in those days, the people with money and the rich kings and so forth, they had guardians for their children. The guardian was make sure the children got educated. The guardian was make sure the children uh, did what they should. They would, they would monitor their behavior, make sure they were staying within the guidelines of what should be done as heirs to the throne. So the law that God sent was a guardian to for us. It was there to make sure we stayed within the guidelines that God would expect us to be, prepping us, getting us ready to be heirs. But that preparation only put us in a position to be ready when Jesus Christ came, that we would have the faith in him to know that our salvation rested in him. Verse 24 says, So the law was guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Justified by faith. It means you can work your way into salvation. There's nothing you can do on your own that would give you eternal life except your faith in Jesus Christ as being the son of the living God who came, who lived here on earth, who was crucified for our sins, who ascended to heaven, who is sitting with the Father on the right hand and is coming back again. That's what justifies us as children of God. It's not through our works, but it's through the works of Jesus Christ. And God knew that even from the beginning of earth, from the foundations of the earth, he knew we as human beings would not be able to live up to the law. He already had it set in place that Jesus had to come. But the law served its purpose by getting us ready, by being our guardians, by trying to keep us hemmed in that we might be the children that God would expect us to be. But it could not provide us with salvation then, and it can't provide us with salvation now. This salvation only comes from our belief in Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, Now this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now that Jesus Christ has come, we no longer need that guardian, which is the laws, to keep us in line. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Things we should not do, the Holy Spirit tells us. Now, are we listening and being obedient to God's Spirit? But the Holy Spirit guides us into all things. He says he will guide us in all truth. He told Jesus told disciples, stay right here where you are until I send you power. He said to I send you power, and that power allows us to overcome sin. It allows us to not to not to be sinners constantly. That's what God's Holy Spirit does. It gives us power to resist the temptation that Satan puts out there in front of us. We just have to rely on that power and be obedient to the power that God has indwelled within us. So he's telling us that we had to wait for Jesus to come, that we might have that power to be obedient. Verse 26 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Tells us we're all children of God through faith. God doesn't have any stepchildren. God doesn't have uh, half brothers and sisters. He says we all are children of God through our faith. That means all of us who believe in the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, we are all children of God. We are all children of God. And, and it just means that, that we're no longer marked by the sin. We are now marked by God. We are no longer under the law. We're under the umbrella of the children of the Most High God because we believe in his Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now we think about baptism, you know, that <clears throat> that's just a symbol of who we should be. 
baptism rep, uh, represents to us that the dying of our old sinful, sinful nature when we are merged in the water and, and on the profession of our faith that we believe in, in uh, you know, God, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that everything that they say is true. And that's when we are immersed in water, representing the burial of Christ, getting rid of that old sin for nature. And then they say we rise as new creatures. We have now put on the clothes of resurrection because with the confession of our sin, Jesus has promised us that we shall live again. And that's when we come out of that water. We're coming out in new bodies. We're coming out with a new spirit. We're coming out with a new man. We're coming out focusing on what God wants us to do. We're now new people. Those old people are passed away. And that's what he was trying to remind them of here when he said, for all of you were baptized in Christ and you have clothed yourself with Christ. That means we should walk like Christ, talk like Christ, do the things that he would do because now we have been clothed with him. We have been, our salvation has been secured. We will all those that believe in Jesus Christ, we will live again because of our belief in him. Verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. He's telling us regardless of our differences, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, ethnic differences, it doesn't matter whether you... Uh, free or slave or not. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. There are no differences because through faith, we all become God's children. He will not look out and say, oh, that person was rich, so therefore they need to be higher. No, there's none of that. We're all the same in the eyes of God. There's nobody, nobody has an edge no child of God has an edge on another child of God. We are all children of God. If 29 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, you know, in the beginning, we talked about the promise that God made to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. All people will be blessed through Abraham because Abraham believed the promise. Abraham believed what God told him, and he was obedient to what God told him to do, even though sometimes he didn't understand what God wanted, why God wanted him to do some, some things. He did not question why God uh, told him to do things. He was obedient to God. And God says, your faith makes you righteous. And that's the same way with us. If we are, are Jesus uh, heirs of the throne of God, we are believers in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the promise made to Abraham had nothing to do with any laws. He didn't give Abraham all these laws to tell him what he needed to be obedient to. It was just his faith in God, walking, moving, doing what God asked him to do. He just obediently went to do it. And we know how far his obedience went when we think about him about to sacrifice his only son because God said so. And he went all the way because God said so. And what did God do for Abraham? Hey, he gave him a lamb of substitution for that sacrifice that he needed to make. And he's done the same for us. He's given us the holy lamb as a substitution. He took on what we should have took on. He died that we should have died so that we might live again. So that is the promise Abraham went obedient all the way as far as he could go. And that's what God is expecting of us, our obedience to him. And we too will get that crown of life because Jesus has already become that sacrificial lamb for us. So I, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson as we talked today about 
freedom and the law, that we have freedom from the law, but our freedom lies in our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, these people in Galatia, they were, they, were being, they were struggling because somebody else had come in and told them things that kind of made sense in their eyes if the, if, the promise, if the Jews were God's chosen people, then it made sense that we should do what they do. But that was not what was intended. So Paul had to go in and try to explain to them they needed to acknowledge they were no longer under the law. Once Jesus Christ came, they were no longer under the law. They were to get their righteousness through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they needed to realize that the law of Moses no longer marked children of God. God, when Jesus came, he came for Jews and Gentiles. There was no hoops that you needed to jump through in order to be the children of God. And that's just what he was trying to get them to understand, not to be persuaded by all this false teaching that was coming into to them. And sometimes we have to recheck ourselves and make sure that the teachings and things that we're following and listening to are in line with God's word. And if they're not in line with God's word, we might to need might need to reevaluate that. And that's what he's telling them. He said, Paul wanted them to know, I've been in there and I've taught you the right way. I've taught you about Jesus Christ. I've told you what he did. I told you how his his uh resurrection has given us eternal life. And as soon as I leave and some other folks come in telling you something totally different, then you're ready to jump ship and go back to listening to them. And he is trying to get them to see it is not necessary to do the things that they do. Works won't get you salvation. You cannot earn salvation by works. It's all based on your faith. Now, the works we do is because of our faith. It's because of God's Holy Spirit indwelling in us that we want to do good works. But good works alone will not get you salvation. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson today. And let me set you up for next week. Next week, we're going to be in Galatians. We're going to come out of this time, chapter 5. Our printed text would be verses 1 through 15. And the title is Freedom, Love, and Faith. So I hope you have a blessed Sunday. I will see some of you in church, so be blessed. Let us pray, and I'll see you next week. Father God, again, we come thanking you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, that when we struggle with what's going on in this world, when there's false teachers jumping up, that we go back to your word, Father, and understand what you have told us, Father. Understand the sacrifice that Jesus had made on our behalf. Help us, Lord, to stay focused. Help us to continue to walk and talk and do the things that Jesus Christ has left for us to do. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name again I pray. Amen. <laughs>